All right, we're all set to go then. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to come into your homes and your classrooms today and, and present to you my program on the Great Lakes. And I hope you enjoy this. And if you have questions, again, uh, send those in the Q&A. Uh, if you have a chat, to also you can send it there and Craig will be monitoring that during the whole program. Uh, we'll answer questions. I'll answer some of your questions at the very end also as we go along. So the first slide here I have is showing you basically the Great Lakes of North America. The Great Lakes do end up flowing. The water flows out into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, again, my name is Alan Ornett. I work at Ludington State Park. Here's an aerial photograph of Ludington State Park. If some of you haven't been here before, they call it the queen of the Michigan State Parks. Uh, you know, we get almost a million visitors a year to this park to enjoy everything from swimming, hiking, boating, uh, just a lot of things to do here at the State Park. One of the highlights of Ludington State Park, bragging a little bit, is we have a historic lighthouse that's been totally restored. It's a big Sabo Point lighthouse here. It's open year, uh, it's open in the summer, I'm sorry, it's summer only, uh, seven days a week for people to go visit and climb the tower. So something to come and visit here at State Park. So as we talk about the uh, Great Lakes himself, <clears throat> we have other beautiful features on the Great Lake also. This happens to be pictured rocks up at Lake Superior and we could do a whole pictorial program on that if we needed to. Well, the Great Lakes, we're gonna talk about the five Great Lakes. As you can see here, Superior, Michigan, here on Erie and Ontario. If you have a, uh, wanna know a way to remember the Great Lakes, just remember the word homes, H-O-M-E-S. Each letter in the word home spells out a Great Lake, here on Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. It's an easy way to remember the five Great Lakes. And as we look at the Great Lakes, what's unique about the Great Lakes is that they're fresh water. I've had a lot of foreigner, foreign people come visit me, uh, people from not even in the Great Lakes region to come here, they see the Great Lakes for the first time and they just can't believe it's not an ocean. It looks like an ocean, but it's not an ocean. It has no salt in it. It's all fresh water, which is good for us because we don't have to worry about sharks or jellyfish, all those nasty things that people have to worry about when they're in the ocean. So, what was here before the Great Lakes? This is a geology map of the bedrock of the Great Lakes. What's underneath the ground below us, the bedrock. And you can see it, it has a lot of different colors in the different lines that's showing fault lines. So what was here before the Great Lakes? Well, this gives us an idea, an idea of what was here. And so we move on and we know that by looking at the rocks on the ground, so when we pick up rock up off the ground, like I, I'm holding up here, when we pick up rocks off the ground, it tells us a story, a story of what was here a long time ago. And in this case, it tells us a story of what was here before the Great Lakes were even around, before we had that famous Lower Peninsula mitten shape. We, knew there were, we now know that there was an ocean here, because the rocks tell us, and I'm gonna do, share that with you in a minute. We know there were volcanoes near, the great, near this area too, not the Great Lakes, but near this area too because again, we have rocks that, that show us that. <clears throat> and in the ocean, it was a warm, shallow ocean at that time around here. And it had a lot of coral, a lot of coral growing in the uh, ocean. And <clears throat> we have evidence of that because we have our state stone. And here's one here that's nice and polished up, the Petoskey stone. It's actually a fossil, piece of fossilized coral from the ancient ocean. And we also have another piece of fossil here, coral fossil. This is called chain, chain coral. So we have fossils that would only be at one time alive in a saltwater, warm, shallow ocean. And we have them all over the state of Michigan, not just certain places, but all over. We also have rocks that tell us about volcanic activity. And as you can see in the photograph, a granite and a basalt, but I actually have some here. This is a chunk of granite. And it's very common to see in Michigan pieces of granite, very, very common. Again, evidence that at one time there was volcanic activity here because granite originally came from the ground as uh, magma, molten lava, molten rock out of the ground. And then uh, we also have basalts like this. This is very common, especially along the shoreline, you find these. 
And this used to be actually lava. I wish they would have called it lava rock, but I wasn't around the time. Now you'll see in that slide, there's a actual grave marker from a cemetery. It happens to be my parents' uh, grave marker. And very common in the cemetery, you'll see a lot of granite used because it's a hard rock. You polish it up and it's beautifully beautiful when you polish it up. So it's very common in the Great Lakes region. The next slide here, we move on further on to the time of the, the ice age. And at this time, the ocean has evaporated away. It's no longer here anymore. Uh, the volcanic activity that was going on, the rifting that was happening, that is no longer active anymore, that has shut down. And so now we, we move on to a time period where we have the ice age. And the ice age is nothing more than having a long winter that lasts for thousands of years. If you imagine a winter, we have winter that lasts for only a few months. Well, imagine having a winter that lasts for thousands of years. So summertime would not get warm enough to melt the snow or ice, and it just kept building up. You kept building up, building up, building up. Now, <clears throat> the ice is not only uh, is not only a couple inches thick, but the ice is actually miles and miles thick. We're talking about ice that the ice that's up to seven miles, some places seven miles thick. And this ice is so tall and it's so big, so heavy, that the ice at the bottom is getting squished, pushed outward. And that moving ice we then call the glacier. And you can see a picture here of the, uh, uh, how much of North America was covered by the, the last ice age, the glacier. And underneath all that ice is the state of Michigan and the Great Lakes is underneath there. And you'll see also the photo I show a, a little slide there of a, how much of North America, uh, United States was covered by the glacier. And you can see again, Michigan was one of the states completely covered. This uh, shows a little bit of how the ice was actually forming the Great Lakes. The ice was gouging into the ground as it moved, this couple miles, three miles of ice pushing down and moving like a bulldozer scraper, and it's scraping out the what will be the future Great Lakes. You can see the series here over the many thousands of years, how that happened. Uh, that in itself is a whole unique story uh, to have a whole program on. So what we're left with after the Ice Age is the watershed of the Great Lakes. And the, the dark line on the outside actually shows us the watershed of the Great Lakes. Now, what they do forget in this photo, this picture, slide, is that they're missing the St. Lawrence Seaway, the St. Lawrence River uh, watershed too, which really is part of the Great Lakes watershed also. But you can see the, the watershed. What that means is a drop of water falls on your head rolls off your head off your and drops off your chin onto the ground. That drop of water continues its journey, eventually make it into a stream, to a river, and then out to a great lake. And then that, that water droplet, that's part of that great lake, then it makes its way around through the uh, uh, different lakes, Lake Erie. And eventually that water droplet in four of the great lakes, Superior, Michigan, Huron, and Erie, that water droplet will combine with other water droplets and fall off a cliff. And this cliff is Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, the famous Niagara Falls. All that water is coming from that, all those water droplets in that watershed running to this one area, over this one area. I, that's my favorite spot in the Great Lakes to go is the Niagara Falls because it's just an awesome sight to see all this water going over the cliff. But it's also to think that some of that water actually fell in where I live or fell maybe fell on top of me and rolled off me. That's a, a cool uh, thing to see. And you can see the arrow. If you're not familiar where Niagara Falls is, it's between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. Okay, so that gives you that there. So the next part of this I want to go into is today. I want to talk about the Great Lakes today, the rise and fall of the Great Lakes. It's a big issue uh, aside from the uh, COVID, the great, the rise and the fall of the Great Lakes, the water levels is a huge issue, making a lot of news. Uh, and so I want to talk about that. So the Great Lakes are important, are important because shipping, we ship things all over the world. Uh, ships come into the Great Lakes, take things out, uh, supplies, things, harvest. And so shipping is very, very important on the Great Lakes. Weather has a lot to do 
with the uh, shipping on the Great Lakes. Uh, you see this picture of this ship. This is the same ship in a storm on Lake Superior. Uh, look how big that ship is. Look how big the wave has to be to cra crash over the top of that, that big ship. So uh, weather uh, is a very important factor. We're getting towards winter. We're in the no November, gales of November right now. So uh, shipping slows down, sometimes even stops if it's a cold enough winter. So weather, with the weather, we have rainfall, we have snowfall, and the snow melt, and we have evaporation. Those three factors will determine how much water we have in our Great Lakes, whether we go up or down. And we're not just talking about one rainstorm, one snowstorm. We're talking about a couple, two, three, four years of weather combined to determine how much water is in the Great Lakes. And all this has to do with the water cycle, of course. We have our the famous water cycle, uh, that's a big factor in the Great Lakes here, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. We have the precipitation, the runoff, we have the evaporation, and I'm going to emphasize the evaporation part of this story. Hey, this Alan. That, yes, Alan, yes, great. question. Um, so do, do all of the Great Lakes ice over every winter, and if anybody's, you know, paying attention, they want to add that to the chat, um, they may have questions for that too, but it, are they, is it normally that all five Great Lakes ice over? No, it's very rare that all five of the Great Lakes will completely freeze over. Very rare. Uh, some winters uh, it does, but not very often. I think the last time Lake Michigan here um, uh, froze over, I think it was about 2013. Uh, we actually had a point where the whole lake froze over. Uh, but generally, there's some open water in the Great Lakes. Some winters, it doesn't freeze over very much at all. Like last winter uh, and the winter before, we had very little ice on the Great Lakes, uh, on Lake Michigan, I should say, on Lake Michigan. So, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, they don't always completely freeze over. That's a very good question. So let's talk about evaporation. It's really, really important in the level of the Great Lakes. Everyone thinks it all has to do with just rain or snow. It, it's, it's more than that, it's evaporation. This is a slide of the Big Sabo River that flows through Ludington State Park. And it happens to be a super cold morning. We have an Arctic uh, cold mass, Arctic dry cold mass moving over the in the air mass moving over the water here. And the river is about 36 degrees, approximately 36 degrees temperature, which is above freezing. The ducks and the geese, of course, like it. They like the open water. But what the slide I'm trying to show you here is the evaporation that's happening. This dry, cold Arctic air going over this water base here that's warmer, above freezing. I'm gonna show you something here. What I have here, is a glass jar and I put a line on it. This resembles Lake Michigan. This is supposed to be Lake Michigan, okay? Use your imagination. I know you all got a good imagination. So this is the water level of Lake Michigan right there. All right, so now I'm gonna show you two different art, uh, air masses. This right here, this pink sponge represents a moist, warm air mass. And when do we get these? Mostly in the warmer months of the year. So when people come by the thousands every day in the summer, hot summer day, and they're complaining how warm it is and how muggy it is, this is the air mass that's moving over right now, moving over the lakes, moving over us. And it's full of water. It, it's just full of water. Why is it full of water? Because this warm air mass has basically come from the Gulf of Mexico area. And in, so that warm golf moisture has, uh, is locked up in this air that then works its way north and over the Great Lakes. So this sponge right here, warm air sponge, is full of water already. So if we take the warm sponge, the warm moist sponge, and we put it in the water, what happens is the sponge isn't going to soak up any more water. The water's already, it already has enough moisture in the sponge that it's not gonna soak up any more water. So the lake level doesn't change a whole lot. It pretty much stays the same during the summertime, even though the air is very, very warm because it's so saturated. But in the winter time, in the winter time, and I use this blue sponge here, this 
representing the dry, dry cold air coming from the Arctic or Canadian North, as, as a lot of people will say. This dry cold air is, there's no moisture in it. It's very dry. Now, how many of you walked across the rug or something in the winter time, and, or even outside, you walk and you touch the door handle and you get this snap, electricity snap, like lightning between your finger and that metal. That's because it's dry, cold air. And so we can resemble that as this air mass goes over the warmer water of the lake, guess what it's gonna do? You can see already what's happening. It's starting to soak up and look at our water level. Now look at the line. The line is high and dry compared to the water level. So what has happened is we've lost a lot of water out of the Great Lakes. Now that will have an effect on our weather here in Michigan. Because, let me go to the next slide here. Here is a satellite photo of a dry, cold Arctic air mass moving over the Great Lakes. And you can see these strings of white lines. Those are clouds. Those are lake effect clouds. The evaporation of water out of the lakes into that cold, dry air is creating all these clouds. And the wind blows these clouds and they come inland. And with these inland winds blowing the clouds in, we get lake effect. We get lake effect rain, we get lake effect snow. That's a very common thing you hear a lot about on the Great Lakes in the winter time, okay? Uh, what will stop this? Craig mentioned, asked the question if the Great Lakes freeze over, and it's not very often, but when the Great Lakes do freeze over, when we get that extreme cold winter, that unusual extreme cold winter, and the Great Lakes completely freeze over, it's like putting a lid on top of a jar. Now the evaporation can't happen because the ice is a lid, but that generally doesn't happen most winters. And so we get lake effect quite a bit. This photograph off to the side is here at Ludington State Park where the river flows out on Lake Michigan. I love this photo because it shows, me, shows you two things. Number one, it shows you lake effect clouds. This is a cold winter day and there's a north wind, cold dry Arctic north wind, and it's coming down Lake Michigan and it's creating clouds over the lake. So you can see the, the lake effect clouds. Now, if the wind changes and starts to come from the west, those lake effect clouds come in, we get a cloudy day, we get snow, snow all day, okay, lake effect snow. The other things this, this uh, photo shows, looking out on Lake Michigan, those ridges you see out there, those are not sand dunes, those ridges out there are ice, ice formations. Because when the lake does start to freeze, when there is starting to freeze, freezing water, the water that doesn't free, freeze completely flat like an ice rink. The waves actually are out in the lake. The ice are, waves are breaking up the ice. The ice gets packed on top of the other and the other one gets put on the other and it builds these ridges out here, ice ridges. And they're, they're actually very beautiful when they start to form. They're also very dangerous when it uh, starts to melt too. They're like many, many glaciers. Now let's move on <clears throat> to some mathematics here. Okay, this is a mathematical, uh, these two next slides, a few next slides show mathematical formulas that actually determine the water level of the Great Lakes. So I mentioned when we have below average rainfall, now we're talking all, more than a year, probably a couple through three years, when we have below average rainfall and we have very cold winters, a, a normal cold winter, a lot of cold air, dry air masses, we get a high water evaporation. When that happens, it equals low water levels. This photograph from 2013 here at Ludington State Park shows us a vast beach, almost a football length of beach in front of our famous historic beach house here at Ludington State Park. A lot of area to play, spread out with your blankets um, and area in, in front of the beach house there because we had low water level, okay? so. We had a, uh, in 2013, we had a vast beach. Now the opposite has happened. Since in the last seven years, things have changed. We've had above rainfall, average rainfall in the Great Lakes region, not just here at Ludington, but in the whole Great Lakes region, in that watershed that I talked about. So above average rainfall, and then you combine that with warmer winters, and believe me, I love winter, because I love the activities do outside in the winter and we haven't here at Ludington we haven't had very good winters for skiing and snowing in the last few winters because we've had warmer winters 
Well, you get those two things happening and we have the water level of the lake actually goes up because there's, there's not the evaporation. The evaporation's not happening because it's warmer winters. We aren't getting those dry Arctic cold fronts moving over the, the Great Lakes. And so our water level goes up. This is a photograph of Orchard Beach State Park, which is just a few miles north of Ludington State Park. And this stairway used to go down to a nice, beautiful sandy beach. Now you can see the stairway walks you into the, the lake itself. The beach is long gone. In fact, this bluff is eroding very, very fast up at Orchard Beach State Park near Manistee. This stairway had to be pulled up and pulled out of the, there before it got washed away and damaged. So this, that's what's happening right now in the, in the Great Lakes area. This is a photograph, this is a slide of the sand dunes here at Ludington State Park, the, the, the four dunes, the ones closest to the beach. And when the water level of the lake goes up, we get a lot of erosion. The sand dune right next to the beach starts to wash away. Now that's a normal thing. That's a normal thing to happen that it will wash away. And what happens when the water level goes down? These sand dunes start to form out towards the shoreline. So we sand dunes near the, near the shoreline come and go. That's a normal thing. And this happens to be when they're being washed away uh, at the time. Now, since, since 2013, seven years ago, we have gained on Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, because actually Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are actually the same lake. We just, humans, we divide the lakes at the Mackinac Bridge. One side's Lake Huron, one side's Lake Michigan. But in reality, Huron and Michigan are both the same lake. So when I say Lake Michigan has gone up five feet in seven years, five extra feet on the whole surface of these lakes, and it's gone up five feet, um, that, that's quite a lot in seven years, both lakes. It's gone up. And so with that, for every one inch, for every one inch, the lake goes up, we lose 10 feet of beach. For every one inch the lake goes down, we gain 10 feet of beach. Now that's a mathematical, if you want to do this, boys and girls at home, uh, you want to do a mathematical formula, five feet, figure how many inches are in five feet, okay? And then you can determine, you can actually see how much shoreline we lose. And in this case, you've got a picture right here. We're losing not only shoreline, but we lose some dunes. Now, the one thing I want to point out here, this is very important, is sometimes we as humans make mistakes, innocent mistakes, we forget about the history. And this has happened in the past over and over, okay? This has happened, lakes go up, lakes go down, go up and down. And sometimes when the lake is low, we forget about this and we allow people to build houses and roads right next to the shoreline on a, on a dune or a bluff. And then when the water level comes up like it is now, people get upset because their houses and roads start to wash away into the lake. It's, it's, it's something we have to, as humans, remember the history because this happens throughout time, up and downs. And we don't want to build a house on a beautiful dune like this because someday that dune will be washed away. Okay, so now we're getting near the end here. I want to talk a little bit about invasives, okay? And with that, I'm getting back to the ship again here. The ship, uh, shipping on the Great Lakes, is, is one of the reasons we have some invasives. Now, shipping is very important. I'm not anti-shipping, and shipping is very important because the Great Lakes open up the breadbasket of North America. What I mean by that is all the corn and soybeans and wheat that's harvested in the vast thousands of acres of the Midwest of Canada and the United States, that, that a lot of that grain goes to other countries around the world to help feed people in other countries. That's a good thing. And the, the Great Lakes being open to the ocean by making the Great Lakes available for ships to come in and out of the, uh, into the ocean, into the Great Lakes and back and forth, allows this grain to be put on ships, taken to other places in the world to help feed people. So it's very important to our economy and it's very important to feeding people around the world. The problem we have is ships like you're seeing right in that slide, ships like that, they have to have some weight into them, whether they're, they're full of grain or they're not full of grain. They have to have some weight that's ballast to push them down a little bit further in the water. Otherwise the wind will blow them out of control. A big ship like that the, with no weight in it, sitting on top of the water would just be like a canoe in the wind. It just wants to blow all over. 
So they had to put, wait, they put ballast in it. They put ballast water. So let's use this example here. And there's a graphics on the side here. A ship is halfway around the world in a port, some port. They get a message that they need to come into the Great Lakes, halfway around the world, come into the Great Lakes and pick up a load of grain to bring back for the people that, so people have food. So the ship at that port, halfway around the world, has these big pumps and they pump in this water in the ballast tanks in the ship that allows the ship to go a little deeper in the water and then allows the ship to come across the ocean safely into the Great Lakes. Now, when the, the ship gets into the Great Lakes, it's gonna release, start releasing some of that ballast water. When it gets to the port, to load up with the, the grain, the ship then gets rid of all the ballast water that it had in its tanks. Now, in that ballast water, unfortunately, a lot of invasive plants and animals have got into our Great Lakes and has disturbed and interrupted our Great Lakes. And uh, this is a kind of a neat little cartoon that I, I stole out of a, uh, an, uh, off a, a comic that shows uh, kind of an exaggeration of what invasive species can do to affect somebody. Now, that's, that's not going to happen, so don't be afraid to go on a boat and this, this thing's going to come out and grab your boat and everything. But it shows that invasives have disrupted what we have here. And I, around that picture, I have different photos showing different invasives from the zebra mussels, quagga mussels that actually filter out the bottom of the food chain to the gobies that eat the eggs of our native fish, uh, especially the perch, um, the gobies to the Eurasian waterfoil that has come in and has is, and is clogged up our rivers and streams. Uh, created a lot of problems. You're going to see more of that, an, another photo of that. And then we got the spiny uh, water flea that actually uh, messes up the food chain, the bottom of the food chain, because it's like, I always like to say, it's like, who's going to eat a porcupine with the, the quills? I mean, you know, dogs do that. They take a bite and they come away with all these quills in their mouth and, and in a lot of pain. Well, kind of the same thing. Who's going to, what kind of fish is going to want to eat a, a, uh, a little organism that has spines on it? Not all, I want to point out now, not all invasive species come in with ballast water. We do have some invasive species in the, in the Great Lakes or near the Great Lakes, some are in and some are near, that have disrupted what our, our native plants and animals too. And these are some of them here from the, uh, the Asian carp, which we're really trying really hard to work with other states around us to keep them out of the Great Lakes. They've got in the Mississippi River, they're from Southeast Asia, uh, that's a whole story in itself, and we're, I'm actually, we're actually putting programs together for the future, so hopefully you'll partake in that of our invasive species program. Um, the sea lamprey, the sea lamprey was a, uh, a fish, a primitive fish that actually lives in the North Atlantic Ocean, and when we made the Great Lakes, we opened up the Great Lakes to shipping, because remember, Niagara Falls was a barrier. That's one of many barriers that fish from the ocean and boats and stuff from the ocean, they couldn't get above the falls. So they had to make a canal and locks around the, these falls. And when we did that, it allowed ships in, but it allowed thing, organisms from the ocean to come in too. And one of those organisms was a sea lamprey. And I'll be doing a whole program on that, putting together a program for this winter. And hopefully uh, you'll come back and partake in the uh, sea lamprey program. I like to, I'll just give you a little tidbit on it. To, want to come back and hear it, the sea lamprey is the vampire of all fish, okay? And they won't affect you, but they do affect us in other ways, not directly. They won't latch onto you and suck the blood out of you, but they do suck the blood out of a fish. Hey, and Alan, we you, got, you just answered we, one of the questions that we had in the poll about the invasive species. We've got just a couple more minutes left, so um, let's get to those questions shortly. Okay, all right. And so let's move down here. So why is all this important? because we like to swim in the, in the Great Lakes. We like swimming, we like the beach, enjoy the beach. We like the fish. Michigan also has the greatest number of registered boats. So all this is important. The Great Lakes are super important to all of us here that we take care of them, okay? So here's a, a picture of a, a, a fisherman's boat that came out of a river that was full of the Eurasian waterfoil. And you could see all that stuff is attached to the uh, boat. And we're asking fishermen to have a different mindset now to clean their boats off before they leave. 
so they don't transport this invasive. So knowledge, respect, and protect are three things that you need to, do, to remember. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Craig. So let me stop sharing here, and you can answer questions. Very good. Excellent. Well, thanks, Alan. Um, I hope our guests got as much out of that as I did, because I, I don't know much about the Great Lakes, because I'm in the interior of Michigan at Hartwick Pines, and so I'm more surrounded by trees than I am water. Um, but there's a couple questions, so I'm going to um, share some of those with you and, and see if we can, hopefully we don't stump you, but um, so <laughs> one of the questions was, and I mentioned this, um, some of those invasive species that get moved around at ballast water, but what, what's meant by um, invasive? What does that mean? Okay, good question. Invasive species means it's a plant, an organism, a plant, an animal that is out of place, okay? It's not supposed to be there. And not only that, it's affecting the things that are supposed to be there, okay? So uh, you could have the, the goby, the little goby that that person's holding. That goby shows up in the river. It's not supposed to be in the Great Lakes watershed. It's from halfway around the world, the Caspian Sea area. That little goby has made its way into our watershed, into our rivers, and here at Ludington, we have a good example. When I started working here 20, almost 25 years ago, we had one of the best perch rivers along Lake Michigan. Now we still have a few perch, but not nearly as many. We've lost probably 90% of our perch in our river. And the reason is, is because the gobies, the gobies have come in and the gobies are a bottom feeder and an invasive species. And what they do is they eat the eggs of the perch. And so our perch population has dropped drastically too. So uh, that's an example. Plants can do the same thing. Plants can, invasive plants can come in and uh, crowd out the native plants and animals and other things that use the native plants for food no longer have that food anymore. So um, that's, that's what we mean by invasives. Things that have out of place and are doing a, a, a has are creating a problem in, in whatever that environment is that they're in. All right, thanks. Um, so uh, we have one of the attendees here that asked, "How deep is Lake Michigan in the middle?" Okay, Lake Michigan in the middle is uh, somewhere around nine hundred feet deep. Wow, I, mean, I don't have the exact figure. I could go to the my big map on the wall behind me and find out exactly. Uh, but it's, it's about 900 feet deep. And it's, uh, if you ever wonder where that, where that part of the depth of the deepest part of Lake Michigan is, if you go to Frankfurt, Michigan, which is just up the shoreline about uh, 45 minutes from Ludington, uh, then you went straight west out to about uh, 40 miles. That's where the deepest spot of Lake Michigan is. All right, excellent. Um, so one of the questions was, and you kind of covered it, how long have you worked at Ludington State Park? You said over 25 years, but speaking of Ludington, uh, what's your favorite place at Ludington? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, this is a, a unique park that uh, it's, it's hard to describe having an opportunity to work here. There is so much here. Um, what's my favorite place? I really don't have one particular favorite place here. Um, it depends on the time of the year. If it's in the winter time, I like to be out in the woods with my snowshoes. It's a beautiful place to snowshoe in the winter out in the woods. If it's in the summertime, the, the lighthouse area out on the shoreline uh, going out to the lighthouse. Uh, there's just a lot of beautiful places here. That's a great question, but I just don't have one particular place in this park that I can point out. Well, I understand that. I have the same situation at Hartwick Pines. I can't I can't pinpoint one thing. Um, so our, another question was, um, are people allowed to climb the dunes at Ludington? Well, that's always a touchy question here. Uh, we encourage, strongly encourage uh, that people stay on trails. We encourage people not abuse the dunes. Uh, we don't allow dune buggy here. Our sacrificial dune buggy place is Silver Lake State Park, which is south of years, um, which people can take their off-road vehicles and have all kinds of fun. But we don't allow that here, Ludington State Park, because that does do a lot of damage to the dune environment. And, and Elizabeth 
Uh, Brockwell Tillman does an excellent program on the sand dunes herself down at Hoffmaster, uh, partake in that. But uh, um, there are some areas that we have kind of designated but people can enjoy running up and down the dune. We know people are going to do that. So we're not going to be the dune police and out there trying to stop them. But uh, there are some areas here that we have uh, designated that people can enjoy running up and down the dune and having fun. And so uh, it seems to have worked out real well over the last several decades. Okay, uh, one final question here. Um, what is your favorite beach at the park and why? What's my favorite beach? Well, I would say the Lake Michigan Beach. Um, to see the changes, just see the awesome of looking out over Lake Michigan at that beach. Um, it, it, just, it just can't beat it. It's like, it's like going to the Grand Canyon and looking over that, looking out over the canyon. Uh, it's just the awesomeness of it. Uh, also, uh, uh, you know, going to Yosemite and just seeing the, the sheer cliffs. It's just, just the overall awesome. And I think the Lake Michigan Beach is that awesome for me. We do have the Hamlin Lake Beach, which is our inland lake, 5,000 out, a uh, 5,000 acre inland lake that uh, has a beach too. And, uh, but it just doesn't have that overall awesomeness to it. So I say the Lake Michigan Beach. Very good. Um, well, thanks again, Alan. Um, great job. Um, Thank you. Hope everybody got something out of that. Like I said, like I did. Um, keep in mind that we have um, other webinar series and you can check out our web pages. I'm going to try sharing here, but it may take a while before it gets unfuzzy just based on my internet connection here. But I'm going to share this with you. Keep in mind that we have um, uh, videos that are um, stored at Nature at Home. And then of course we're doing the Nature at School videos um, and, and live presentations and of well, as well our Facebook page uh, at My Nature DNR. That is updated daily, um, which is a tough job that one of our wonderful staff uh, members with the DNR works endlessly on uh, sharing anything from trees to lakes to animals to flowers to pollinators, you name it, it's there. Um, check it out, please. And if there's nothing else, then I thank you once again. Hope everybody has a nice warm day here in Gaylord. Um, it is snowing and we got about an inch overnight. So um, that's my job the rest of the day is to get rid of that snow. So thanks everybody. Um, we will see you later. <laughs>